taking your time in these hot days to come to a very interesting panel discussion that um, IWPR, Khabar, and OSC Academy in Bishkek have a great honor to offer to you. Today we'll be talking about the perceptions of China in Central Asia, about the problems and perspectives. And before we actually start the session, I would like to take a few moments to, do, um, to, to make some housekeeping notes. First of all, uh, please be aware that um, the entire meeting, the presentations will be broadcasted and we will also be taking occasional snapshots. So if you have joined us online, please uh, try to keep your camera on if it's possible, uh, because that way we will see your faces and it will be uh, much more interactive, uh, we would say. Uh, and uh, because, of the, because of the event is already being broadcasted, we would also like to ask the audience uh, who has joined us here in person not to take any pictures or to take any videos because all these materials will be available on a featured article on Kabar. So uh, we assure you that you will not miss anything. You will be able to go back and watch it all over again. The second thing, um, uh, for, the, for the audience who is joining us online, we have Q&A box. Please make sure to leave your questions in a Q&A box and uh, our speakers um, and our discussants <coughs> Uh, we'll address them in a duly manner. And uh, last but not least, we would like to ask all of you to be very kind and polite to each other. The, the issue, these uh, topics can get quite edgy and they can uh, get quite heated, but yeah, let's try to uh, keep it polite and kind and um, um, uh, we will uh, uh, proceed in a very uh, uh, duly and, and, and civilized manner. And of course, if you have some uh, technical issues, please make sure to send us messages um, on, on chat box, or if you have any technical issues here, um, uh, myself and, and our colleagues here will be keeping an eye on it. And if you want a program, uh, please scan the QR codes, you will be able to access them online. So uh, that's all on the housekeeping part, and without further ado, please um, let me allow to introduce um, Dr. Alexander Wolters, the uh, director of the OSC Academy in Bishkek. The floor is yours. Thank you, Abek. Yeah, dear colleagues, dear guests, it's a pleasure to welcome you today here at the OSC Academy. Despite all the heat, but I think our conditioners are working, so I hope it, they will continue throughout the panel and make this a very enjoyable session and discussion. For us at the Academy, it's uh, it's, it's a strategy, I would say. It's our interest to promote events like this and to engage into discussions about the impact of China in Central Asia. Over the past years, we had several roundtables. We have research projects ongoing and produced also several publications that look at the rising power and influence, you would say, of China in Kyrgyzstan and its neighboring states. For us at the OSC Academy, it comes yeah, as a two-sided two -sided sword, so to say, that we strike down to have a better understanding of China's influence in the region. As you know, China is not part of the OEC. It's not even a so-called partner in cooperation. And so the question we sometimes receive is, why do you deal with China? It has nothing to do with the OEC. That's true. On the other hand, we can afford sometimes here at the OEC Academy to raise questions, to address questions that others cannot, because China is not part of the OEC. We have realized that not turning to China, not trying to understand how China operates in the region of Central Asia, doesn't make sense if you want to have a better understanding of security and development, the two core foundational activities of the OEC in Central Asia. And therefore, we are very interested to build further up our capacities and to have more research conducted in Central Asia and also platforms like today's events in which we can meet and discuss about what's going on. Unfortunately, I will not be able today to listen to the keynote speech or the discussion, but I would very much like to take the opportunity to express my gratitude to those who have, again, helped us here at the Academy to make this event happen. First and foremost, I would like to thank Rafael Raffaello Pantucci, yes, Raffaello Pantucci for his keynote speech, and also our discussants, Timur Umarov, Isaac Chalubek, and Nargiza Muratalieva, 
who have agreed to join us into the discussion and later on, of course, to help the floor to continue the uh, debate. I'm very thankful for IBEC to have taken over the moderation and I'm very grateful to our partners, that is Kaba, again, Nargiza, thank you very much, and IWPR, a partner with whom we are long in cooperation, with whom we have been conducting already events like that and hopefully will be also in the future. Last but not least, I would like to express my gratitude to the Norwegian Institute of Foreign Affairs, which I know not only support IWPR, but do support us here at the Academy also, substantially and continuously for many years. I wish everybody in the room and, of course, online a great event and an exciting discussion ahead. Thank you so much for joining us today, and back to you, Abe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wol Walters, for an um, opening speech. Now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Nargiza Murataliva, the representative of WPR and the analytical reports editor at Khabar Asia. Thank you. Uh, dear guests and partners, I'm delighted to see, uh, today to see many familiar faces at yet another expert panel that we are holding today. Uh, witnessing such uh, a high interest in our discussions gives me hope that uh, facilitating regular expert meeting uh, is vital for producing new discourses on uh, Central Asia's development. The topic of perceptions of China uh, in Central Asia has long been in the air, and I think gathering today uh, this panel is very timely especially in the context that Kyrgyzstan is going uh, to launch a huge project, railway project, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. Uh, this expert meeting uh, is part of a series under the Amplify, Verify, Engage uh, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia project, generously funded by uh, Norwegian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we are also very honored and proud to be holding this event with the OSC Academy, our long-term partner, uh, and look forward to having more events with you in the future. Uh, after the event, we will publish the highlight on our Kabar Asia uh, website, uh, so uh, please make sure to follow us on social media and uh, on our website. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nargiza, for um, an um, opening speech. Uh, so t today we have our, our, our uh, expert panel is divided into two parts. First, we would have a keynote speech by Raffaello Pantucci, followed by questions and answers uh, section. And then we will have several discussions, uh, the, the panelists who will also uh, deliver short presentations, which is also followed by questions and answers session. So be aware that we have two questions and answer sessions, and if you are unable to ask your question in the first section, you always have a chance for the second one. And after that, we will have a coffee break where you can take some of the discussions that you haven't finished uh, in the uh, hall. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Raffaello Pantucci, a senior fellow at the uh, Rajaram School of International Studies in Singapore, as well as the Senior Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute at the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Raffaello, you have uh, 15 uh, to 20 minutes to deliver your keynote speech. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, to uh, Alex, to Nargiza, to Ibeck, um, to OSC Academy, uh, to IWPR and to Kabar for the kind invitation uh, to come and speak to you uh, today. Um, it's a huge disappointment that I can't be there to enjoy Bishkek's heat with you. Um, but anyway, greetings to Singapore is equally warm, but probably a little more humid, to be honest with you. Um, what I wanted to uh, talk about today uh, was specifically to look at how uh, China has responded uh, to some of the recent events that we've seen in Eurasia. Um, specifically, we've seen a lot of instability across the region, really. It's been in many ways a very unstable year uh, since the fall of Kabul uh, last year to the Taliban. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to go through some of these big events and look at how China's responded and then offer what I think is a sort of overarching sense of what this tells us about how China is going to go forwards uh, and be a player across this region. 
to sort of briefly summarize, uh, my sense is that China is continuing in very much the vein that it has before, which is broadly a position of hedging, uh, where they are trying to sort of balance against all sides, trying not to overcommit to anything. But at the same time, through sheer economic weight and gravity, they are becoming the most kind of influential uh, player on the ground. And so that is having a kind of transformative effect. Uh, but at the same time, they don't want to take the leadership role that sort of follows from this substantial economic influence that I think they are slowly accruing unto themselves. So that's kind of the underlying point I think that you can see. Uh, and I think it's reflected in a lot of this. I mean, of course, it's important to remember that everything that we've seen happen in the past year has happened in the shade of COVID-19. Uh, while the rest of the world has really moved on from COVID, uh, China has not. Uh, you know, China has only recently started to talk about opening up its borders, uh, allowing travel once again. Even within China, travel is difficult. Um, and this has had a real effect on sort of China and Chinese thinking and Chinese links out to the world. And so that, I think, hangs over everything that we're seeing happening at the moment. Um, and to some degree, is I think, going to stymie. Uh, it, it's an important element to remember in some ways. But underpinning all of that, I think what's interesting is the degree to which we've really seen China continue on on trend lines that I think were very observable before. And if we start with the events in Kabul uh, last year when the Taliban took over, um, what's interesting, I think, about that uh, from a Chinese specific perspective here I'm focusing on is that China managed to almost seamlessly move its engagement from working quite closely with the Republic government uh, in Afghanistan to working with the Taliban government. And it seems to have been able to do this pretty much without missing a beat. Um, in fact, what has been a bit of a result has been that we've seen projects that previously appeared quite blocked up um, appear to have potentially unlocked themselves, um, which I think reflects in some ways the kind of the way in which China's managed to sort of continue its relations to both sides. Now, the reasons for this, I think, are fairly easy to explain. And that is that, you know, whoever is empowering Kabul uh, will look at a map and notice that China is their richest neighbor, most influential neighbor in many ways on the world stage, um, and clearly is going to be an important actor to deal with and engage with. And this is why I think you saw during the Republic government period and now during the Taliban period, China's always been kind of a power that governments have wanted to try to engage with. At the end of the day, they see this sort of big golden bucket at the end of the Chinese rainbow, um, and they want a piece of that. And so they want to be very careful to try to maintain a relationship with Beijing that ensures that they can do that. And that gives Beijing uh, a very good set of cards to play because they will always have this kind of ace in the hole, this potential carrot of investment or economic opportunity that whoever's in power in Kabul will want. And so that will allow them to continue to sort of maintain some engagement. But what's interesting, I think, is that you know, notwithstanding uh, uh, this carrot there and this kind of seamless transition, what's also happened is many of the problems that China encountered before continue to exist as well. So previously, the Chinese were very worried about what was happening um, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan uh, with Uyghur militants they worried about who were gathering, uh, mostly it was presumed to be in the north of the country, um, who were potentially who were working alongside the Taliban uh, to try to potentially launch attacks against China or Chinese interests. Um, and this enduring concern has continued today where we continue to see that whenever Wang Yi meets with Mutaki or senior Chinese figures meet, they continue to press home this point, wanting the Taliban to hand over Uyghur militants that they believe are hiding in Afghanistan. And the Taliban don't appear very receptive to this request. They appear receptive enough to move uh, the Uyghur contingent that had gathered, which uh, from various accounts appears to be at best in the low hundreds, uh, from where apparently they used to be in sort of the Badakhshan area of Afghanistan over to the other side of the country, but they haven't acquiesced to the Chinese request to have them handed over or, or to do something more permanent about them. And I think it was quite significant that we just saw a video emerge from uh, uh, the Turkestan Islamic Party uh, of their leader, Abdul Haq, celebrating uh, Eid in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, which kind of goes against the grain of a narrative that says that the Taliban are working, you know, in lockstep with the Chinese. If that was really the case, the Taliban would certainly be doing a bit more about this than letting this guy, you know, show off the fact that he's celebrating events in the country. Um, so, you know, I think that does reflect the problem that the Chinese continue to have. But I think what's interesting, what's changed 
uh, is that China is a lot more prominent in Afghanistan. Previously, it was present, but it was clearly a second tier actor and a second tier player. But what we've seen happen since the fall of Kabul to the Taliban is China has become much more prominent. But I think the reason for that is, I would argue, twofold. Um, I think on the one hand, there has been a noticeable drop in violence. Um, and this has resulted in a situation in which, frankly, a lot more Chinese entrepreneurs are willing to have a go. Um, these are not people necessarily linked to state-owned enterprises. Uh, they are not you know, Chinese traders that are being sent by the Chinese government. They are Chinese traders who are kind of allowed to travel by the Chinese government and basically see Afghanistan as a country that's next door, that's underdeveloped, that has natural resources, that has a population, that has opportunities that they could explore. You know, you must remember that uh, Chinese entrepreneurs are in general a very hardy bunch and willing to go to some pretty you know, dangerous environments and kind of have a go and see what happens. And I think we've certainly seen a surge of these people going in uh, to Afghanistan. On the other side, we've also seen an increase in official Chinese activity, and uh, some of that has been frankly very good. You know, if we look at some of the aid that's been pushed through, if we look at the response that we're seeing now to the earthquake, uh, the planes that are coming in, this is good. It, you know, the Afghans need, uh, frankly, uh, this kind of support, uh, you know, and it's positive for the Afghan people that China is bringing some aid to the country. But I think what's interesting is that none of the sort of efforts that we see by the government, the Chinese government, are game changers. Um, the ones that could be game changers are the big mineral investment projects, big mining projects that frankly were being discussed in the Republic government, but didn't get off the ground for a variety of reasons. Um, most prominent is the project in Messinac, uh, in Logar province, a big copper, uh, copper mine, which is quite near the surface, uh, which is one that, you know, the Republic government gave to a Chinese company back in 2007. And frankly, the Chinese company sat on it ever since then coming up with, you know, a litany of reasons why they couldn't do the project. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at what the Chinese government is saying or the Chinese company is saying about the reasons that they're still having difficulty starting the project up, they're very similar, frankly, to the problems that they had before. The truth is this is a difficult country to engage in, and it's one that's going to require massive investment to actually get a big mining project like that really off the ground. So, you know, a lot of the issues they had before, they continue to exist, and actually, arguably, you haven't got the same kind of governmental infrastructure in place. So, you know, but what do I translate all of this into? What you can see is the Chinese government is leaning into its relationship with the Taliban, and it's doing that in large part because that's what the Taliban wants. They want to be able to have international countries that they're engaging with, showing them that they are a government. And for the Chinese perspective, this is, you know, an easy thing to do. You can, you know, with a relatively low commitment, you know, some aid convoys, some aid support, opening up a few limited trade corridors, you know, telling your companies to restart conversations. None of this is really big commitments, uh, but it does keep the conversation going. It does make it look to the Taliban and the world like China is engaging quite prominently. Um, and this is positive and it kind of bolsters the Taliban government, which is, I think, one of China's major concerns that actually the situation in Kabul could fall back into some sort of complete chaos with a sort of fragmentary government, you know, a sort of a country broken up by lots of warlord factions ruling different parts of it, you know, which would be a kind of nightmare situation for them to manage. Far better to have a kind of central government of some sort that rules much of the country, uh, deal with them and sort of innate that will give them a much easier kind of interlocutor to partner with. So in many ways, the hedge that we saw China doing before when the United States was president of Afghanistan has continued. Um, and I think this is a kind of running theme that I want to pick up in all the other events that we've seen as well. Uh, to move instead to Kazakhstan at the beginning of the year, where we saw the instability you know, initial what appeared to be food price riot, uh, fuel price riots that then escalated into what appears to have been a power struggle of sorts uh, between the old uh, Nazarbayev uh, clan factions and uh, the new Tokayev government. Um, this, you know, I think took China, like frankly most, I think, of the region by surprise. Everyone was quite shocked by what happened there. But I think what was interesting was the way in which China reacted, which was essentially first the same shock as everybody else, and then second, just sort of sitting back and watching. Um, and when, you know, Russia, when President Tokayev went to Moscow um, and asked Moscow to, you know, deploy under the banner of CSTO forces, uh, under the banner of CSTO forces into Kazakhstan to help relieve pressure on some of his forces to enable him to sort of clean up the mess that there was and to help uh, stabilize the country. 
you know, there was narratives, quite hysterical narratives, I would argue, in the media saying that, you know, well, this was a huge blow to Chinese influence in the country. Um, I'm not so sure that was the case. I think from China's perspective, they were quite happy that Moscow, frankly, stepped in to fix this or to play a role stabilizing uh, the rudder. Uh, from their perspective, they had no capacity or interest in going in to do something like this. Their presence might have just made the situation worse, frankly. Um, and frankly, they've never done this before. What on earth or how on earth would they have done this? So, you know, from their perspective, there was no appetite, no interest, no desire to go in. I think they were very happy, frankly, that Moscow was willing and able to step in. And frankly, I think they're, you know, quite content for that. And from their perspective, taking a watching brief to this situation was kind of the optimal situation. We didn't see any major damage to Chinese interests. There was some question about some of the economic links and some of the uh, powerful figures in Kazakhstan that the Chinese have sort of cultivated over the years, you know, being defenestrated in the protests um, and as a result of the sort of fallout from them and what impact that might have. But I think the truth is that, you know, President Tokayev recognizes China is a very important economic actor to him. He's always cultivated a very strong relationship with China himself. And I think that will continue. And so from China's perspective, there was no need to sort of change in some ways from the posture that they had before and just kind of let things play out as they will, which I think goes again to my sort of hedge theory. If we then flip forwards uh, to the events in February of this year, uh, when uh, Moscow, uh, when President Putin uh, decided uh, to invade uh, Ukraine um, and really upend the kind of Eurasian order and the global order in a, a really quite dramatic way, this is something that has posed uh, a sort of complicated issue uh, for Beijing. But what's interesting is their response has been, again, this kind of hedging approach, this approach of not really over committing to one or the other. Um, well, you know, it is certainly true that China has, you know, made no bones of the fact that they continue to be very strong supporters of Russia. They've been very careful about doing this in a way that doesn't appear to be piling in to some of the Russian narratives about how much this entire conflict is Ukraine's fault. Um, what they support much more is narratives of blaming this on the West blaming this on NATO, blaming this on the sort of wider geopolitical struggle of the West versus Russia, and by default, China as well, um, and apportioning the blame for the conflict in that direction as well. In fact, uh, you know, we've seen the Chinese continue to say, you know, try to maintain positive noises towards Ukraine. They've done very little tangibly to support uh, these positive noises. But I think what's interesting to me is that on the other side of the coin, you can look at the Ukrainian government, which actually hasn't said much, frankly, to condemn uh, China's hedging position and China's, frankly, open support uh, for Moscow. Instead, Ukraine, you know, recognizing that pre the war, China was their biggest trading partner. Um, and, you know, at the end of the conflict, however, uh, you know, the, 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 the conflict shakes out, is very likely to continue to be a very important actor to Ukraine. Um, you know, this is, the, the Ukrainians have no desire in some ways to sever that link as well. Uh, they would rather focus their attention, their anger on Moscow, um, and don't feel the same need to sort of uh, pass glancing blows towards uh, Beijing. I would point to this in contrast to what we've seen them say towards India. Well, we have seen some quite angry condemnation of Delhi's approach of supporting Russia. I think that, you know, what, but what does this say from China's perspective? It says from China's perspective that they have got power, governments in both sides, that they're able to sort of maintain a relationship, that want to maintain some sort of relationship with them. Clearly, it's very different. And clearly, I'm sure Ukraine would want uh, uh, Beijing to do more about uh, trying to reign in Moscow or trying to condemn Moscow or trying to support them against Moscow. But at the same time, I think Kiev recognizes that, you know, China will be an important partner for them at the end of the day. Um, and it's important for them to find a way of trying to thread the needle some, some uh, uh, through, uh, through the two. And this, I think, gives China the opportunity to continue in this sort of hedging position, where they really try to pile most of the blame for the conflict on Ukraine. You look in the sort of Chinese media, you can regularly see this, you know, the Chinese uh, expert community, Chinese officials, the uh, PLA, the MFA, you know, whatever comments they make, you know, it almost universally comes back to NATO being the root of the problem here. And now that we see NATO talk increasingly uh, going in an anti-China direction, this will, I think, only bolster that narrative further. So this entire thing won't get blamed on the Ukrainians, won't get blamed on the Russians, get blamed on NATO, and China will continue to try to sort of thread the needle somewhere of the way through. The final conflict I want to touch on in the uh, final minutes um, of my presentation in an attempt to try to stick to uh, schedule um, is uh, Tajikistan, which I think is a really interesting uh, case study also of uh, this kind of hedging approach in some ways. 
Um, and I say this because Tajikistan, of course, gets a lot of attention from a Chinese security perspective, because it is uh, a country in Central Asia where we have seen China, you know, deploy forces, build bases, uh, support the local security apparatus. Now, they've actually supported and done a lot with the security apparatus in all the other countries in Central Asia as well. But in Tajikistan is the place where they've actually built bases and, you know, made a presence that actually felt, which in Chinese terms is quite rare. There aren't that many Chinese bases outside China around the world. Um, you know, I think the only one that's admitted to at the moment is in Djibouti. Uh, but, you know, there's uh, there's uh, suspicions of one being built in Cambodia. Um, and there's certainly been rumors of uh, something in Pakistan as well. Um, but certainly Tajikistan is the only one that we kind of know, and we can point to and we can see um, as a sort of physical thing that's happening. And so Chinese you know, security interest and attention in Tajikistan has always been something that's been a great interest and focus to them. But I think what's interesting to note is the degree to which this is focused on their own narrow uh, security interests. So unlike, for example, uh, Moscow, which in some ways treats this region as its kind of soft underbelly. And when it has forces deployed in Tajikistan, these are part of an effort to strengthen that border, fearful that this is ultimately going to sweep in uh, into Russia and seeing you know, this region essentially extension of itself. From a Chinese perspective, it's really about having oversight and overwatch of potential security threats from Afghanistan coming into Tajikistan and ultimately coming back to China. Um, and it's really about making sure that they have eyes on this because they don't entirely trust the Tajiks. It's not really about uh, stabilizing uh, Tajikistan. It's really about ensuring that they're able to ensure their own security concerns specifically. And that's kind of where they're gonna stop. Now, what's been interesting about the recent uh, trouble that we've seen in Tajikistan is, well, a number of, well, two things really I'll point to specifically. One is the degree to which we have seen, well, three things, sorry. Uh, one is the degree to which we've seen zero commentary about Tajikistan in uh, the Chinese media. You know, even if you look at uh, some of the sort of large uh, chat platforms like Guangcha, um, or you look at any of the sort of, uh, you know, Chinese media outlets, you know, there's been almost zero coverage of what's been going in, on in Tajikistan. It's been sort of, you know, completely scrubbed from uh, uh, from the Chinese media, because I think Chinese media doesn't really want to engage with the fact that there is this, you know, pretty large scale instability happening on a region that it shares a border with. Um, on the other side, we've also seen uh, now uh, recently uh, reports of um, of China uh, speeding through construction of roads that were being discussed uh, through this region. And this is something uh, which, you know, is not entirely new. China's actually built roads in this part of the world before. Uh, I remember traveling around uh, Gabao years ago um, and, you know, talking to locals about, you know, Chinese investment and projects there. And, you know, people would say, oh, yeah, the Chinese built that road, they built this road there. And, you know, actually they quite like the Chinese investment because <laughs> their perspective was, you know, when the government talks about coming to build roads, um, we heard about them, but we never actually saw anything happen. Or if they did happen, it took a really long time. When the Chinese said they were going to come and build something, they talked about it, they arrived, the project was done, and we had a thing at the end of it. And they kind of appreciated the infrastructure benefits that they got. So, you know, there was a sort of semi-positive view that was seen there. But what we've seen happen now is the government, which has quite clearly wanted to increase some of its connectivity and uh, economic investment into the region, but of course has no resources to do it, has rushed through various road and tunnel projects uh, that are being done now that the Chinese company is going to come and implement um, that is going to happen now very rapidly, um, which I think is going to be part of an effort to try to essentially help stabilize the region subsequently. You know, the, the government in Tajikistan, like governments all over the world and in China in particular, often see infrastructure development as a key component of ultimately ensuring stability. And so China is rushing in there to support quickly the government in a goal that they're trying to achieve. Clearly, the Chinese believe that the government in uh, Tajikistan is going to survive uh, the current chaos um, and are willing and are eager to support in any way they can to essentially ensure that this government stays up, that it does help stabilize this region. But at the same time, what we're not seeing, you know, with a, you know, is a large scale Chinese commitment in security terms throughout the region. There's been stories of you know, Chinese uh, companies doing more security training out there. Uh, we've seen stories of Chinese company, I mean, in Tajikistan doing this more generally. We've seen more stories of Chinese security, you know, trying to help the locals build up some of their base and capabilities. But we haven't seen China leaning in to try to find ways of helping stabilize the situation. We haven't seen Chinese senior Chinese figures coming to talk about it. In fact, we've seen them generally trying to stay as silent as they can on the issues and trying to avoid any discussion. And that, again, I think speaks to the bigger issue which, you know, uh, is the point I'll, I'll conclude on, which is, you know, this is in some ways the key point about, I think, Chinese interests and effort in this region. 
China is a country which is increasingly becoming, you know, the most consequential, uh, one of the most important players on the ground. Uh, this is heavily driven by economic investment, increasingly driven also by investment in the digital space and the e-commerce space and the finance space. And these, you know, the building blocks of the economies for tomorrow, which increasingly we're seeing and being delivered in the region by Chinese companies. Um, and China's sort of playing a role in a growing range and has for the past decade, really, been playing a growing role across this region. But it's doing it in a way that's very different, I think, to some of the previous powers that we've seen playing this kind of a role in the region. So whereas Russia basically saw this region as an extension of itself in some ways, you know, China sees this in a much more transactional light. And anything it does, it does it because its companies are interested, it has a particular border concern, it has a particular intelligence or economic concern. It doesn't do it to help stabilize the kind of wider environment. It does it because they're interested essentially in one specific goal, and that's what they're going to focus on. And I think this is going to be the important thing to watch going forwards. You're going to have a country, China, the big influential player on the ground uh, across this region, who is going to not want to try to take ownership of any of the major problems that we do see, frankly, in security terms and other terms across this region. You know, and I've just listed four things that, well, Ukraine, okay, is extra, extra regional, but, you know, has a heavy impact on the region. But we can look at the border clash between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan as well. You know, it's not going to try to play a role in any of these to help stabilize them. It's going to let them uh, continue on and just sort of engage with whoever's uh, there at the end. Um, and I'm suspicious I've got a little bit over my 20 minutes, and I apologize, but I will uh, stop there and look forward to uh, questions, discussion, and hearing the other presenters. Thank you very much, Raffaello, for a very interesting presentation on how China has grown, um, has risen uh, into prominence in Central Asia. And I'm very sure that we have um, a lot of interesting questions from the audience. And before we take questions, just a um, small uh, request to the audience as a, courtesy, uh, as, a, as a courtesy to the translators, please try to speak not too fast so that every single idea of yours, every point gets translated properly uh, and, and correctly. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions on the floor here? Yes, there are questions to Rafael. We can take them now. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we don't have a question from the audience yet, but we have from online audience. Um, Tigen. Oh, Tigen. Tigen. If we can turn on your microphone. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, thank you very much for the event and for this uh, very valuable speech that uh, Mr. Pantucci did. And, uh, I do work in the, the Central Asia Barometer and I studied the public opinion in Central Asia. And uh, I should agree with you that indeed the projects on the infrastructure, energy development or technological exchange, they are highly appreciated in the region. Uh, however, um, I'm not sure if I have a pleasure to share some data, but what we see is the real problem with the soft power of China in the Central Asia. And the opinion on that question is a bit polarized like the half is favorable, somewhat favorable, but the others, they are even sometimes hostile. And that's a closely linked to different issues such as the land or the treatment of the Muslims and so on. But in the light of the current uh, complicated geopolitical situation with the role also of the Russia in the region, do you think that the China will intensify their efforts to somehow build a better face for the Central Asian countries? Obviously, maybe the public opinion is not the first concern for the policymakers, uh, especially here, but still, uh, what is your opinion on that issue? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that really interesting question. And, you know, uh, it's great to hear from some from Central Asia Barometer. Uh, I follow your guys' work, and of course, it's it's great to it's great to hear from you. I, look, I think it's a really interesting question, and it's a, a valid one. I mean, sinophobia is kind of something that I, you know, in my travel around the region, I found consistently uh, everywhere. Uh, and you know, sometimes it was based on personal experience. Uh, people would report to me, you know, that the village they lived near had a, a Chinese project that had sort of polluted a local water source or something like that, um, or the company, the Chinese company they worked for, was wasn't treating them very well. Um, um, but then I met others who, you know, were, were were very happy and, you know, enjoyed the infrastructure and others who were really positive on China and saw the incredible, you know, potential economic opportunities to be benefit to be got. So 
I, I, I recognize the kind of shades and the polarized perspectives that you see. I think your question about, you know, what we're trying to do about this, I think, sorry. I, um, okay, I, I thought I sort of heard someone coming in, but I'll continue on. Um, I think the uh, dilemma for China about how to influence this is something that frankly is something that China has been trying to do for some time. And I'm not sure that actually they always assess that public opinion is not important because what they have noticed is in some countries, uh, the negative view is such that it frankly causes them problems on the ground. And so we can see companies trying to do their own corporate social responsibility projects in an attempt to try to win favor with the locals, recognizing that if the locals don't support them, they will block the project and cause them trouble on the ground. So they don't want they don't want that negativity as well. So, you know, there is some effort. So I think the point I would say is that they are always trying to do that. I think the difficulty is the Chinese aren't very good at <laughs> uh, soft power in many ways um, because they've got a pretty blunt uh, approach to this, you know. And you know, I think that the I you know buying op eds in local newspapers, you know, using broadcasting their media, you know, that's going to win you very little in by way of public kind of sway in some ways. And so, you know, they do try a lot of these methods. They do try to co-opt local opinion formers. Uh, they do sponsor projects. They do sort of soft power efforts of, you know, sponsoring schools, offering scholarships to people. And I'm sure that has an effect at a kind of low level. But, you know, I think they struggle from a bigger uh, image problem in the region. I think the interesting question that I think was implicit in yours was the idea of with Russia, with views about Russia becoming much more polarized in the region as well, will there be a kind of opening in some way for China? And I think the point from a soft power perspective is that's a very difficult uh, fissure or gap to fit into. And so I think China will struggle to create enough of a nuanced uh, uh, you know, soft power approach to deal with that or, or to fit into that kind of opening uh, that might particularly exist. My own view is I think actually Chinese soft power is generally quite clumsy, but I think actually the timeline we should be thinking about is longer than the one we sometimes think about. Um, and I say that because I think there is, uh, you know, going to be a growing amount of people uh, in Central Asia who will have stronger links to China going forwards by force of the economic power that we see coming and the economic power that is coming, and the numbers of young people who are going to do scholarships in China, the amount of officials who speak Mandarin, the amount of people who have had some contact with China, which is increasing regularly. And so I think over time, you'll see a kind of change in some ways in Central Asian society more broadly, whereas people won't necessarily always see Chinese as these sort of alien beings that are completely apart from them, but increasingly will feel some sort of a connection. And that I think will be where the real soft power question will come in. If China is able to leverage that, um, and I don't know how long it's going to take to play out, you know, 10 years, maybe more, maybe less. Um, I think that's going to be the really interesting soft power angle to observe. Uh, thank you, Raffaello, uh, for a very detailed answer. And uh, do we have uh, questions from the floor at the OEC Academy? We do have one question, right? Did you raise your hand? Oh. Okay. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself brief briefly, two sentences, and then your question? Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, good, good, good afternoon, right? Okay. Uh, my name is Ilyas. I am a uh, graduate student at the University of British Columbia studying anthropology. So I had a, a question about, uh, particularly for the Kyrgyzstan, I would guess. Uh, so uh, after the October revolution if you can say so we do have a new government here uh, and uh, if with the previous government it was much more clear what was the relationship with China uh, with the uh, with the new authorities it's uh, not even with China but even with Russia the relationship is very blurry and what is in your opinion the standing of uh, the Japarov administration and the uh, and Beijing essentially and the, uh, like, and the prospects for the future. Thank you. Um, I, I, I can, should I take that question or should I take a couple? Uh, uh, Raffaello, if you could also take the questions from the chat. There are two questions, one from Sergey and one from Tatiana. Thank you. 
By all means, um, I will uh, tackle Ilias first, um, who is a very long way from uh, British Columbia. <laughs> but um, I think it's it's an interesting question. I look, I I, I think I have not seen uh, much uh, change. I mean, you know, much change in some ways in terms of the Kyrgyz relationship with China. Um, I think that the Chinese seem to have quite happily embraced uh, the new authorities. Um, I think we have to remember that this has happened in the shade of COVID, uh, which has had a huge effect on you know, Chinese uh, policymaking, decision-making and thinking in general. Um, and so for a country uh, uh, like Kyrgyzstan, which you know, from a Chinese perspective, I think they saw uh, the trouble uh, as unsurprising. Um, I think they've concluded that this is a kind of a regular thing that does take place in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and they continue to sort of engage uh, with the government. I think they've, I haven't seen any particular expressions towards the Yaparov government that change uh, my opinion of how the Chinese relationship with Kyrgyzstan stands now as it did before. Um, what I would say is, of course, now there's a lot more discussion about the railway. Um, and they're talking in terms that, you know, maybe suggest that they've unlocked this. Now, you know, I'm I haven't been to Bishkek recently, unfortunately, so I don't know, you know, the granularity of what the new thinking is at the moment. But, you know, I noticed that they're talking about now doing a new feasibility study that's due to report in autumn. And what I would say is I've heard about a lot of feasibility studies on this project over the years. So, you know, it, it's possible that this could they might have unlocked this one at last and it's finally going to actually happen. Um, but I would also say that I've yet to be convinced that that is what's really happening here and now. And whether that's linked to the Yaparov government or not, I don't know. I can certainly see how uh, his administration would want to push this project forwards because it's a great thing. It would be wonderful for the country. It would be a benefit. And it's good always to bring these sorts of big infrastructure projects in. Um, but I think we have to see. I think we still have to wait and see a little bit if this is finally going to get this project moving. You know, this railway is one of those ones you know, like the Pipeline D from Turkmenistan or like TAPI, you know, which has been much discussed um, and it's often difficult to tell how much we're actually seeing movement. So that would be my thoughts on Ilyas' question. I apologize if it's not uh, exactly, you know, do you think, but my sense is there has been much of a change, uh, but colleagues in Bishkek might correct me and uh, please feel free to if I'm wrong on that. Um, in terms of the questions in the chat, uh, Sergey asks an interesting question about what is China's understanding of the liberal world order today and how is it going to transform it and or will create its own? I think it's a really interesting question. I think, you know, uh, China interprets liberal world order as being the West's opposition to it. So, you know, and that is increasingly being gathered up into, you know, Western led structures like uh, G7, uh, like NATO, um, and where these are increasing grouped together as part of this kind of law wider alliance against China. And so I think you can see happening at the moment, which builds on, frankly, what's been happening for quite a long time in many ways, or at least the last decade, I'd argue, across the region, is you can see China trying to sort of uh, strengthen alternatives, an alternative kind of structure and order to this. The SCO, the Shanghai Corporation Organization, is the most obvious example of this, um, but you can see it also in BRICS. Um, and you can see in China's attempts and some of the speeches that you see Chinese leaders giving at other, you know, regional formats or global formats. Uh, you know, if you look at the Tunshi initiative that they pushed around Afghanistan, that was very much trying to take ownership of, you know, the sort of wider uh, Eurasian discussions around Afghanistan um, without, you know, owning the problem, but actually trying to, you know, show that they had some sort of answers potentially to this. Um, so, you know, I think that they are trying to do this, but I think, What's also clear is that, you know, it's not clear to me on what firm ground some of these structures actually are. Because if we look at what China is actually committing to a lot of them, it's often quite thin, you know? And even when we talk about some of the economic structures that China's pushing out, you know, the sort of alternatives to SWIFT, the idea of China's digital currency being uh, going out or digitalizing the RMB, or Chinese tech companies sort of going out increasing internationally, they're still very mired, frankly, in domestic Chinese questions. You know, so tech, for example, the digital Silk Road was kind of the big banner thing that is kind of being pushed out. And this kind of Chinese vision for basically connectivity around the world all hooked up to China. But if we look at the past year, we've seen this incredible, you know, defenestration and attack 
on uh, Chinese tech companies within China. And these are theoretically the beasts that are going out to conquer the world. And yet China at home is going after them politically. That doesn't say to me that this sort of bigger vision for creating an alternative global structure has really been entirely thought through. It's been articulated and there's the rhetoric there to build it. And you can see how other countries actually quite like it as well. Russia clearly does, because it gives it a kind of alternative vehicle to posture with on the world stage. Uh, countries like India like it as well, because they like to continue to show themselves as somewhere sort of in between and not in any one specific camp. Um, and other, you know, countries like Iran, which are finding themselves desperately trying to build alliances, also find it. So, you know, you can see how everyone's using this in some way. But I think if we look at it from a purely Chinese perspective, we can see that the rhetoric is certainly there. But I've yet to be convinced of the actual means uh, to realize it following through. And then on the second question, uh, um, looking at what is China's approach to Armenia and Turkey's aspirations in the region, if any, um, I think on, on Armenia, I'll be honest, my answer would be very thin. I have done a limited amount of research looking at Armenia specifically, uh, but my sense has always been that it's kind of seen as part of the Caucasus. The mo more interesting Caucasus country in, in sort of China's terms, I've always thought was Georgia, because the Georgians so keenly, uh, you know, sit in this interesting place of trying to engage with the West and wanting to be very European, but at the same time actually being quite proactive in terms of their engagement with China. So they, I think, are quite dynamic in that regard, and that's something that China's responded to. But Armenia, I, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't, I wouldn't know enough to be able to give you uh, a detail. I'll answer Tatiana, I apologize. Um, on Turkey, I think Turkey is interesting because I think Turkey has complicated. Um, you know, it, there, there was a time, I think, where the Turkey China relationship was very uh, problematic and awkward, and it still is to some degrees. If we think back to 2009, the riots in Urumqi and uh, President Erdogan's comments about what's been happening in Xinjiang uh, with Uyghurs. Um, that caused a lot of tension and ruction and led to sort of tensions that you saw across the region. But if we look to today, it seems as though Turkey and China managed to mend their relationship. There's considerable Chinese investment increasingly in Turkey and Turkey is welcoming this. Um, and we can also see the two of them working together actually in uh, in parts of Central Asia on uh, hard security questions. There is certainly some evidence to support that China and Turkey have been working together to deal with the problem of Uyghur militancy. Um, and this is something that, you know, uh, they would encourage. I think at the end of the day, China probably doesn't necessarily see Turkey as a threat in the region, uh, because at the end of the day, they recognize that, you know, whatever Turkish ambitions to, you know, a wider pan-Turkism might be, you know, that's something we've heard about for a long time. Um, and it's often very hard to see what the there there of it actually is. Um, you know, Turkey does project this vision of itself as kind of the agabe of this entire region, but you know, uh, it's often not clear what that actually means in practice. And, you know, Turkey will always have a very special connection uh, to the region, uh, but I'm not sure that it would be competitive to China in the same way. I think even if it did start to get to the position where it could be, I think what you'd end up would be seeing a similar situation to what we see with China and Russia in the region, which is essentially uh, an acceptance, a tacit acceptance and a willingness to operate in parallel to each other, not necessarily cooperating, not necessarily competing, just sort of continuing to move forwards and trying not to let yourselves directly uh, clash. So uh, I'll stop there and thank you uh, for those really interesting questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pantucci, for very interesting um, answers, for very detailed answers. And thank you very much to the audience, both online and in person, for asking these uh, questions. And now we have, uh, we have to move to the second part of, uh, of our um, panel discussion. And it will consist of three back-to-back -back presentations by Timur Umarov, uh, Aizat Shailobek, and Nargiza Murataliva. And at the end of this session, we would also have a chance to ask questions. So before inviting the discussants um, uh, to deliver their speeches, I would like to encourage you to make this um, empirical, theoretical, and logical ties to the keynote speech that we have just heard so that uh, we start building some sort of a dialogue. Uh, so, be, uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Timur Umarov um, from uh, Uzbekistan, uh, who has a degree in China Studies and International Relations from the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration, as well as from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, known as MGIMO. He is also an alumni of the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Young Ambassadors and the Carnegie Endowment's Central Asian Futures Program. So without further ado, uh, Timur is joining us online. Timur, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes to deliver. Thank your you. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to see many familiar faces. Um, and I hope um, my speech will be uh, useful and um, interesting. Um, so um, I, I wanted to talk about the obvious thing, the elephant in the room that um, changed everything, the war in Ukraine. Um, and from the point of view um, of us uh, who live in Central Asia, it seems that um, this will change everything, um, considering that we're uh, connected and we are dependent on uh, Russia very heavily. Um, and at the same time, uh, we are becoming more and more tied together with uh, China. Um, and when this event, like uh, the one that started in February 24th happens, um, it means that um, for Central Asia, it's not going to only change our uh, ties with um, Russia, obviously, but also uh, it might change how China is, uh, you know, seeing itself uh, in Central Asia and how China is acting here. Um, and, and because of this thinking, um, I've been seeing a lot of takes um, and a lot of opinions that um, you know, Russia right now will be gone from Central Asia, and this is the time that China will use uh, to come to the region and just replace Russia uh, in a very short period of time. But um, my um, question here um, is, um, is it really going to happen? Uh, because uh, from what I see and from what um, actually data and statistics right now show and from, uh, you know, obvious reasons, um, I think that um, the presence of uh, Russia in Central Asia um, is so dominant that it's gone. It's going to take much longer um, for us to kind of lower Russia's dominance here um, in in Central Asia, and um, I, I will tell why. So uh, it's of course obvious that Russia is becoming um, this toxic partner that no one wants to have any relations with, uh, but um, here in Central Asia, we just have to, uh, you know, because um, several reasons, but um, mostly uh, because we are um, in this region and we cannot move away from, from uh, Russia. And whether we want it or not, uh, we have to cooperate. We have to um, be very, um, careful and accurate, um, and, and that is why uh, when it comes to official statements from different um, officials in the region, uh, you see that they are trying their best to, uh, on the one hand, not be associated with the political regime in Russia and its actions in Ukraine, and at the same time, um, wants uh, not to make Russia very angry because, um, you know, it is risky for everyone. Um, but at the same time, um, the crisis that uh, Russia has right now with the world means um, that it drives um, Central Asia away from itself with its own hands. Um, you know, every single crisis that Russia had with uh, with the, with the West, uh, with the collective West, so-called, uh, had um, the effect on Central Asia to, um, you know, find more connections with the world, to, you know, to diversify its dependence on Russia. Um, and this crisis will also add fuel to this process. Um, and we actually have already seen how uh, different, you know, regional players and other countries are becoming more and more active and proactive in Central Asia. And of course, number one country that is, you know, coming to mind to every uh, person um, is China, because China is right here, is the second economy, um, soon to be the first economy in the world. Uh, and China really has um, interests in the region that are closely tied, 
with its national interests. Um, but there are certain limits that um, China has um, when it comes to its presence in Central Asia. And I will go through um, three or maybe four uh, dimensions where um, you know, China can, where, where Chinese presence can change. Like, first of all, it's economy, obviously. Um, when we take a look at economic relationship that Central Asia has with the world, we will see that China here is the most dynamic partner. Um, it's everywhere in the news. Um, it's a number one trade partner uh, for almost all Central Asian countries. Uh, and uh, China uh, is kind of dedicated to um, increasing its economic presence in the region. Um, and with the war um, in Ukraine and with the Russia's isolation from the world uh, economy, this process uh, might also be um, you know, fostered. Uh, not for sorry uh, to become more you know obvious. Um, just um, uh, for example, if we take a look at the trade that Central Asia has with Russia, we will see that Central Asia imports a lot of uh, you know machinery uh, from Russia. Uh, and um, according to uh, economists that follow Russia's economic development, uh, with the current uh, sanctions that some even call embargo, uh, for Russia it will be uh, sometimes impossible to produce those machinery um, and, and technological products that it used to uh, produce because it, uh, for, for, for its production Russia needs uh, materials that it used to, uh, you know, import from the world in, in the majority, uh, almost 80% of the materials were uh, not Russian. Uh, so it means that Russia will, um, it will be difficult for Russia to produce the machinery uh, that is needed for its own economy, let alone for other economies, let alone for export. Um, and and in, here in Central Asia, uh, uh, um, we will need uh, to find, um, you know, something to replace Russian um, import with. Um, and, and here, of course, uh, China might be um, this gateway, the plan B for uh, Central Asia. Other than that, um, um, in, in, in economic terms, um, um, I think that, um, you know, what ties very closely Russia and Central Asia is, of course, the uh, labor migration. And here, China cannot um, replace Russia for obvious reasons. Um, it's even difficult for Central Asians to get a tourist visa to Russia, let alone go there and work. And, um, um, you know, this is not uh, something that China is famous for. Yeah, uh, we don't have many labor migrants in China and China has its own people that it doesn't know um, what to do with. So uh, in this question, um, uh, Russia um, at this point even, even cannot be replaced. So um, uh, even in the sphere that uh, China is seen as the most dynamic partner in, uh, there are certain limits uh, for increase of um, Chinese presence. Um, in uh, political terms, um, there are even more obstacles and uh, more um, limits for uh, you know, China's presence in the region. Um, and uh, the, my explanation of that is uh, 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 you know, pretty obvious again. Um, for um, you know, if you uh, take a look at big uh, domestic uh, political changes and events that have been happening happening inside Central Asia, you would see that um, in, in many cases, um, Russia's um, influence on the domestic politics uh, was very high. Yeah, take any um, uh, revolution in, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, take uh, the January events in Kazakhstan, take the transition of power 
um, in Turkmenistan and uh, back in the day in Uzbekistan, uh, take the you know upcoming transition of power in Tajikistan. Everywhere you see that Russia was present. Um, um, and um, uh, the reason for that is, is obvious. The um, you know political elites um, that we have here in Central Asia and 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 they have there in Russia are uh, the um, you know people from one cohort that were born in Soviet Union, speak one language, share same values, uh, have gone through one educational system, and and you know know a lot about. Um, uh, Lenin uh, and um, um, Marx ideology and stuff like that. So it's easy for them to understand each other and they have one language to speak to one another. And this is quite different when it comes to China. Um, China cannot, um, I mean, I just uh, cannot imagine Xi Jinping calling to one of the leaders of Central Asia and like chatting um, or having some kind of a, um, you know, just talk about something. Um, but uh, I, I do imagine that um, yesterday uh, when Vladimir Putin came to uh, Dushanbe, he had a very good conversation with Rahman about just random stuff. Um, and, and it of course means that there is much, much more trust between Central Asian political elites and Russian political elites. And this is not gonna change anytime soon till uh, those um, regime, political regimes that we have in all those countries exist. And the last uh, point um, in, in, in terms of uh, security, um, Russia's presence um, in security dimension in Central Asia is um, very high. Yeah, I'm wrapping up, sorry. Um, and um, uh, right now, uh, this is something that also uh, might change, but we don't see any, um, you know, real facts for that. Um, um, of course, uh, many people talk about China's growing presence in security dimension here um, in Central Asia, especially when it comes to Tajikistan. Um, but uh, here I uh, very much agree with what Rafaela said. Uh, China's interest in security dimension in Central Asia are closely connected to its national interests and China sees Central Asia as the extension of its national security. Um, and that is why um, it will be doing only those um, you know, actions here in Central Asia to secure its own nat um, national, um, national security and will not go um, the extra mile to kind of uh, push away other actors from uh, from Central Asia. So uh, here I also don't see uh, much change. I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, sorry for being a little longer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timur. Uh, indeed, it was a very interesting presentation because uh, at uh, Rafael's keynote speech, we saw how uh, China rose to prominence in Central Asia and Timur kindly provided insights on the limitations and barriers to rising to prominence, right? So I can really see how we're building up the, um, the, the uh, discussion here. Uh, but please, if you have questions, keep them until the end of the session. And now I'd like to invite our colleague from the OSC Academy, um, Aizat Shailubek. So she's a, a senior uh, research assistant at the OSC Academy at the moment. And before joining our team, she was a freelance researcher with interest in China affairs in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, Aizat's um, uh, educational background is quite diverse as well. So she's got her uh, BA uh, in American Studies from the International University of Kyrgyzstan. And she holds a master's degree uh, in Central Asian Studies from the American University in Central Asia. So now I would like to give her the floor. Um, and. Um, this one, right? Wait. Wait. Um, do you guys see? Yeah. Uh, um, maybe you should share it. Wait. Share. Thank 
you very much. Uh, so today I will uh, present my uh, publication, which is uh, titled uh, Discussing Xenophobia in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, which was published by um, Central Asian Academic Affairs uh, last year. So, um, so because of I have limited time, I try to give meaning of this research paper in limited time. So actually this research paper um, investigates uh, how Chinese migrants are um, perceived by uh, local Kyrgyzstani people and what are, what are the xenophobic groups and xenophobic groups and what factors uh, influence on their xenophobic attitudes and also so uh, after collapse of USSR, China became main uh, economic partner of uh, Kyrgyzstan Central Asian countries behind the Russia. So um, uh, economic and uh, growing economic So uh, China's ec um, growing economy impacted on Kyrgyzstan a lot, bringing flood of uh, bringing flood of goods and bringing massive number of Chinese migrants, workers, traders, businessmen, and teachers. By the way, with the Confucius Institute, which was established by uh, 2007, uh, later on. So seeing presence of uh, massive Chinese migrants every day, local uh, normal people, uh, residents began to fear, uh, exacerbate their uh, fear that uh, believing prejudice and um, conspiracy theory that uh, China will occupy Kyrgyzstan or take uh, some part of uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, especially when Kyrgyzstan has a huge debt in front of China's uh, Exim Bank. So. Um, uh, in order to understand this picture, uh, I will put two main research questions. How do locals in Kyrgyzstan perceive China and Chinese people, as I mentioned in the beginning, and how do they express their xenophilia or xenophobia, and what are the experiences of Chinese people living and working in Kyrgyzstan, and how do they experience their discriminatory behavior? So in order to understand how Chinese migrants are perceived by uh, Kyrgyzstani people, I, uh, I used a co component of qualitative me uh, methods uh, using um, in-depth interview and case study, life uh, observation. Uh, so these uh, qualitative methods triangulate between these uh, three methods. So I interviewed um, economic uh, group, uh, which is bazaar traders, um, and the other one is interesting group is nationalist group, Kyrgyz Charolot. Later on, I will provide more information who are these guys. So, and then in order to see full picture, I, I could interview also Chinese immigrants coming from different walks of life, like businessmen, traders, students, teachers, um, doctors, by the way. So hypothesis is both groups would be xenophobic for two reasons. One is for economic, um, due to economic uh, reason, the other is nationalist, ultra-nationalism stance. So, um, this is, um, sorry for not good quality of picture, this is um, the main entrance of Zhonghai section, uh, Zhonghai section of uh, Dordoi Bazaar, uh, where Chinese trader has been working. Um, so, um, in order to give just summary of this section, uh, the uh, previous researchers, scholars found out, revealed that um, in, in Central Asia, especially in Kyrgyzstan, traders are concerned by uh, massive Chinese uh, traders because they think they will take over our jobs, so they're concerned and they see them as a high competitors. But interestingly, my study found out on the contrary that traders are not concerned of being competitor, I mean, of being com competing with them and also they don't see them as a high competitors, but then they do uh, concern as more like cultural differences, uh, pointing out negative sides of Chinese traders. And of course they do believe of, um, um, Chinese occupation of Kyrgyz land, blaming uh, Kyrgyz uh, officials uh, involved being uh, involved in corruption, and also, uh, of course, they were also um, they had negative opinion of building in, um, family institution between uh, Kyrgyz and uh, uh, Chinese people, so which uh, this interethnic marriage will lead to Chinese occupation into into Kyrgyzstan. So this reveal, of course, confirmed on studies Central Asia that. 
locals, uh, local traders, and, or just local people, residents, do mistrust. I mean, they have mistrust. They don't believe Chinese uh, migrants. They uh, are alarmed. So they do believe on, on uh, prejudice that Chinese expansion, Chinese soft power in Kyrgyzstan. So in order to understand, this sec next section is nationalist group who are the Kyrgyz Chorolor. <coughs> Kyrgyz Chorolor which translates from Kyrgyz language into English, 40 knights or 40 soldiers of uh, Hero Manas. It takes names from Epic Manas. So in this group was established 2010 when uh, 40 Kyrgyz men went to Altai just to pray in spirit of Manas. Uh, and then after they came back, they set a goal to preserve Kyrgyz culture, custom, and tradition, language, uh, in order to pass away for uh, to a younger generation of Kyrgyz people, to descendants, yeah. So um, they, uh, they prefer Kyrgyz uh, officials as a betrayal of Kyrgyz nation, uh, putting their first interest and uh, not, thinking about, uh, not thinking about Kyrgyz people's life, being involved in corruption again. So, um, and then they, uh, they uh, despite they, they said, we have um, signed memorandum with internal Ministry of Internal Affairs and uh, some other five different bodies of Kyrgyz government, but then uh, they uh, blame Kyrgyz government doing that they are not doing their jobs properly. So um, <coughs> here, um, uh, here their actions actually. Um, when I interviewed uh, around ten people, and then. Before I meet these guys, I always thought they are uneducated or ultra nationalist, super nationalist. They think that their interest always on the first. But then after meeting those guys, these are roughly around 5,000 members of this Kyrgyz Chorolor around the, uh, across the Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so um, <coughs> these Kyrgyz Chorolor. Uh, members include doctors, physicians, educated, uneducated, old and young generations as well. So, but then always they don't have, they don't have always, they don't share always same, uh, same idea. So in 2014, you can see here, they raided uh, the Chinese, cl uh, Chinese club, which is located in Tatan, a Chinese shopping center, where allegedly a Chinese men spent their leisure time with uh, Kyrgyz girls. So blaming those Kyrgyz girls, bringing, uh, bringing, um, uh, bringing shame on Kyrgyz dignity, honor, and also asking, assaulting Chinese businessmen and their work permission and show their visas, etc. So they filmed this video and then distributed on social sites, uh, Facebook, YouTube. So people had had debate on this topic. One group, uh, uh, one group supported this cultural or steep. They are doing good job. If government is not doing their job, they um, so they supported the other part of group. They blamed being. Uh, calling them as uh, chauvinism or ultra-nationalist, and they don't have right to do that. In 2013, they deported certified illegal Chinese migrants uh, checking brick, uh, brick factory, which, is, uh, which was located in uh, Chui district, and checking their visas, and they found out illegal uh, around 35 Chinese migrants, and they, they deported back to China. In 2015, they also checked a changing company, asking their work permission, and also uh, providing better uh, work condition for Kyrgyz workers. So after that, they have checked the Chinese manager fired all the Kyrgyz, um, Kyrgyz uh, workers. So in 2018-19, they raided some number of Chinese companies again. Like for example, uh, oil refinery factory, which was um, located um, 50 miles away from Bishkek, um, Karabalta. So uh, when I interviewed them, they said we are nationalists, in not in negative way, but in positive way. So they, they put, uh, in this way, they, they think that we serve in Kyrgyz nation and we should, um, we should uh, preserve our uh, dignity, honor of Kyrgyz people. But when it comes to Chinese migrants, they have, uh, they have a totally negative opinion uh, about Chinese migrants, about their life, culture, food, and everything. And then, they also, they also um, experts that negative opinion of Chinese inter-ethnic marriage between Chinese and 
and Kyrgyz women, which also lead, according to them, to the Chinese occupation and blaming government, and uh, being in, in both corruption and corruption, and then also they believe in, in, in soft power, uh, the Chinese occupation, which will be uh, also taking some part of uh, land to China, as in the case of Tajikistan or Sri Lanka, they think that huge debt will, be, uh, will, bring, to, uh, will bring to, of course, some uh, Chinese occupation and soft power. But they said uh, seven commandments of some uh, monastic that in between international, national, like international um, cooperation, there should be friendly relationship. We are not anti-Chinese, we are anti-illegal migrants, uh, foreigners, but when they do, when they see their actions, demonstration, it is obvious they are anti-Chinese group. Uh, so <clears throat> in order to understand the full picture, I also interviewed um, Chinese migrants here. This woman has been working at Dordoi, uh, at Zhonghai, uh, uh, section of Dordoi for about 20 years. She, ha she has married a uh, Kyrgyz man, but then later divorced, but then, so I, I interviewed um, people from different background, doctors, um, businessmen, teachers, students, just to see uh, do they really face uh, discrimination uh, or they, do they really feel discriminatory behavior towards themselves. So, um, <clears throat> According to them, uh, of course, having a positive, um, positive, a positive experience with local people, they do emphasize that they every day face with discriminatory behavior towards themselves. But interestingly, comparing to doctors, students, teachers, mostly Chinese businessmen face with discrimination and xenophobia. So one Chinese businessman, 50 years old, he mentioned that despite that China is bringing a lot of investment money into Kyrgyzstan, we do really feel that Kyrgyz people mistrust us, they don't welcome us. So, and also they confirmed the Kyrgyz officials involved in corruption and also <clears throat> they do confirm xenophobia is prevalent in, in Kyrgyzstan. So, um, actually, um, this um, Chinese topic, uh, xenophobia is very sensitive uh, topic in Kyrgyzstan, and I just did some summaries of this uh, research paper, and this research paper looked at how Chinese migrants perceived by Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstani people, and what kind of experiences, positive ex and negative experience, do really um, have Chinese migrants in Kyrgyzstan. So I have found out this ultra-nationalist group are mostly xenophobic group rather than bazaar traders, but mostly a majority of Kyrgyz people believe of Chinese uh, uh, occupation, believing prejudice, prejudices, and uh, conspiracy theory of China will take over uh, some part of land um, as other countries, as I mentioned before. So this research contributes to the literature by demonstrating how different biases and prejudices form and reinforce through everyday experiences and interactions between local Chinese migrants and contemporary Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, Aizat. Yeah, and um, it was all, again a very interesting presentation, which showed how xenophobia or, uh, plays out in everyday life on a very uh, local, on a ground level, right? And also, I think it, it makes very good connections or contention points with the, the presentations that, that were before, like um, uh, saying, like. The, the first speech, in the first speech, we, we saw how China is rising to prominence in Central Asia. Timur demonstrated the overall barriers and limits. And here, Aizat showed how this actually limits work out in everyday life in a very particular situation with very particular people with on, on an individual level, this Chorolor as a group. And, and a Chinese businessman, etc. Right? And I'm pretty sure you have a, a lot of questions, but please hold them. We have one uh, final presentation uh, by Nargiza Muratalieva. So she is the editor in chief for analytical reports in Khabar Asia, and uh, she holds a PhD from uh, uh, Kyrgyz Russian Slavic University, and she has co-authored uh, authored and co-authored. Uh, a lot of monographs as well as more than 50 publications and one of the most famous monographs being 
uh, Russia, uh, China and Russia in Central Asia. So without further ado, I also give the floor to uh, Nargiza. You also have 20 minutes to deliver your speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agir. Um, thank you so much for your tolerance. My presentation would be the last today. I'll speak about soft power of China and Kyrgyzstan, its issues and limitations. Uh, in my presentation, uh, I would focus on uh, what updates uh, has China done uh, in its soft power in Kyrgyzstan and in Central Asia. Uh, what uh, obstacles does China have in its soft power strategy in Kyrgyzstan and uh, conclusions. So uh, I guess uh, uh, I don't have to speak a lot about how uh, China important is for uh, Kyrgyzstan and for Central Asia that it's our main investor, uh, creditor and trade partner uh, after Russia and other countries. Uh, I would say uh, also the same as uh, Izad, my colleague, um, told in her speech that image of China in Kyrgyzstan is worsening year by year. And I would refer to uh, Central Asia Barometer Survey, uh, which uh, was done in uh, the period from 2017 uh, to uh, fall uh, 2021. And uh, within Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, respondents have shown an increasingly negative view of China. Uh, and Kyrgyzstan has remained more consistently negative with the number of those who indicated that they had a very unfavorable opinion of the nation steadily rising with each uh, subsequent survey wave. Uh, China is criticized in uh, Kyrgyzstan not only due to lack of transparency of cooperation and corruption cases, but also due to lack of large-scale and uh, breakthrough projects. And in particular, for example, unlike Nur Sultan, Bishkek cannot boost any implemented multilateral projects under the auspices of Belt and Road Initiative. And as you know, uh, in next uh, 2023 year, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, China, and uh, Kyrgyzstan are planning to uh, start building railway project. Uh, in the context of this, it's uh, rather important how uh, China will promote its soft power in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so, if to speak about uh, updates of uh, China's soft power in Kyrgyzstan and in Central Asia, I would say the first institutional adjustments uh, and bring you an example of the format of C5 plus 1, uh, which was introduced in 2020. So, uh, this format is, is rather successful and uh, I can say that it was established um, uh, to avoid criticism that China prefers bilateral uh, relations over multilateral cooperation in Central Asia and to show that China has somehow its own strategy in Central Asia. Uh, this year in January during uh, Central Asian States and China Online Summit, uh, China announced that it will provide about 100 government scholarship to the five Central Asian countries and strive to bring the number of sister cities within the five countries uh, to uh, 100 pairs in the next five, ten, or five to ten years. Uh, and also uh, stands ready to make all five Central Asian countries approved destinations for Chinese tourists. Uh, if to speak about uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I would bring you an example that uh, due to Kyrgyzstan's initiative, the uh, SCO Cultural and Integration Center was established in Bishkek in 2021. It may also help to China to promote its uh, soft power in the region under the auspices of uh, STO. Next is a well-known vaccine diplomacy. I guess uh, uh, 
I have uh, no necessity to speak a lot about this vaccine uh, diplomacy and how China helped to Central Asian countries to uh, bring uh, vaccines uh, to our region. Uh, next, green cooperation uh, based on the structure of uh, Chinese investments in Kurdistan. We can't unfortunately uh, speak about uh, green projects yet. Nevertheless, Kyrgyzstan was optimistic for China in terms of building a number of hydroelectric power plants, uh, which didn't materialize. But uh, this year, in response, uh, China has begun to ramp up its investment activities in green projects in Kyrgyzstan, although still to a limited extent. So uh, this year, Kyrgyzstan uh, signed with Chinese investors agreement on construction of solar power plant uh, in Isakul region. Uh, next, uh, I would say about uh, enlargement of educational program lists. Uh, so, in 2021, uh, Chinese embassy uh, is, has established uh, the following the Chinese Dream Scholarship Program. And uh, it is designed for uh, high school graduates in Kyrgyzstan and selected uh, high school graduates will travel to China to study undergraduate programs with a full scholarship. Uh, there are a lot of uh, private schools uh, in Kyrgyzstan which offer uh, learning Chinese language and a lot of uh, educational institutions which offer Chinese language uh, all over uh, the Kyrgyzstan. And about uh, 11, about 12 universities in Bishkek have exchange programs organized jointly with uh, Chinese universities. Uh, China also is working on its uh, social uh, media presence, and I can say that it increased its presence in social networks. Uh, there has been increase in um, such uh, networks uh, as Facebook, Instagram, for example, Chinese embassy uh, promotes their page on uh, Facebook and Instagram very competently. And uh, TikTok is rather popular in Central Asia, I can say, uh, especially for uh, the youth or in our countries. And uh, its uh, audience is growing year by year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, China has uh, some kind of uh, limitations and obstacles in Kyrgyzstan and in uh, Central Asia. And the main obstacle uh, lies in the blurring of its ideological component. Uh, while the idea of uh, liberal values, democracy, human rights promoted by Western countries uh, is universal, Chinese values haven't yet acquired a uh, streamlined form and content. Uh, what is the Shanghai spirit, uh, which name already contains Sinocentrism? Uh, what is the fill up and content of a community with a shared future, promoted and often repeated by Chinese politicians? What does Chinese soft power offer besides a multipolar world order? And how attractive is uh, the Chinese political system for the population of Central Asian countries watching with apprehension the expanding of digital dictatorship and re-education camps? Next, uh, lack of NGOs. Uh, I would cite Joseph Nye. Uh, he wrote, China lacks uh, the many non-governmental organizations that generate much of America's soft power. We can't say uh, that China relies on uh, the um, NGOs and uh, we can't say that its political system is rather attractive for Central Asian uh, countries. Uh, Next, it's focus on the Chinese language speakers. As a rule, agents of Chinese soft power prefer to mainly focus on those uh, who either already speak Chinese or are in the process of learning it. However, the percentage of native Chinese native speakers in Kyrgyzstan and in the region is still quite low, which means that the scope of Chinese soft power is quite narrow and limited. 
compared to the US or European Union or uh, Turkey uh, promoting their soft power, they work not only with native speakers or learners of their respective languages, but also with those who are still limited by the knowledge of one language, uh, be it Kyrgyz or Russian. Uh, next, uh, one year ago, I conducted uh, some interviews uh, with um, uh, those who studied uh, in China. And uh, what uh, we have found out that uh, they talked about uh, nostrification uh, of their diplomas problems. And they noted that Chinese uh, education is not fully respected owing to difficulties with the nostrification of their diplomas, uh, which can cause problems uh, when applying for job and uh, create doubts about the expertise of China trained specialists. Uh, compared to Russia, we can say that Russia's educational programs are more sustainable in Kyrgyzstan with recognition of diplomas and employment opportunities. Uh, next uh, is poor public diplomacy. If to compare to Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, we see lack of round tables, conferences, discussions on um, BRI opportunities and on bilateral cooperation between China and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and uh, compared to those initiated by uh, the Chinese uh, embassies or Chinese agents of soft power, uh, their uh, discussions uh, uh, usually uh, don't criticize or don't find some kind of uh, future or common uh, prospects for cooperation, uh, more uh, like propaganda. Uh, next, world war diplomacy, a uh, rather tough rhetoric of Chinese world war diplomats is difficult to synchronize with soft power and uh, soft tools. And uh, China is more associated in Kyrgyzstan and in Central Asia as polluted country, not green civilization. Despite the start of financing green projects in Kyrgyzstan by China, uh, the celestial empire is still not associated as a green civilization, and China is on the top of 10 most polluting countries. Uh, if to speak about Kyrgyzstan, Chinese uh, loans and investments have left a negative consequence, especially after scandals or the modernization of uh, combined heat power plant in uh, Bishkek. So, in conclusion, as it's seen, China is, uh, in its policy in Kyrgyzstan, still relies more on hard power than on soft power. The topic of debt trap and economic dependence of Kyrgyzstan on China is still the most discussed, which cannot be said about the positive aspects of cooperation. It can be argued that China's soft power in Kyrgyzstan is still characterized by inefficiency and lack of, relative, of creative approach. And China does little work with focusing uh, more on those who learn Chinese language. And despite the desire to expand China's soft power tools, in implementation and sphere of influence is difficult to measure with the ever increasing popularity of Western countries' soft power. China also lacks ideological content and specificity. And if Russia promotes the ideas of Eurasianism, taking advantage of the Russian-speaking environment and the West have occupied a solid niche in the promotion of universal values. What idea and values China can offer in its soft power is still a question. However, against the backdrop uh, of Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine, China has a window of opportunity in Central Asia, and the extent to which China continues to lean toward soft or hard instruments will determine the success of its policy as a whole. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, apologies. So I was on and off, uh, yeah, doing also some logistical things. But from what I got, it was a, um, Nargiza really presented 
how these soft power tools like language courses, Confucius Institute, etc. Uh, they work in Central Asia, right? Like who goes to those courses, etc. So we did have a very good combination of presentations, right? So Timur talked about this uh, also in comparison with Russia, right? Like about the barriers and limits to uh, China's influence in Central Asia. Then we talked on the ground level how this um, xenophobia plays out in everyday life. And here you can, uh, you saw this soft power tools that China is using and soft power tools that they are not using, like those round tables or like, uh, like the, the discussions of BRI opportunities. And here um, we will now start taking questions both online and offline. And if you have questions, please raise your hand and Samar will um, yeah, bring you the microphone. So yeah, let's start right here. Yeah. Uh, before asking your questions, just a couple of sentences introducing yourself and then uh, your question, right? And after that, Samar. Hello, thank you for your presentations. Uh, my name is Ekaterina Kasimova. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Languages and Civilizations in France. So I'm sorry for my English and thank you for, to translators for their perfect job today. Um, I have a question to Ms. Shiloh Beck. Um, it's about xenophobia because I'm working on uh, soft power of China and I'm very interested uh, of China's per perceptions in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, you said that when you interviewed one of businessmen uh, in the uh, Junhai market, uh, he told that xenophobia is prevalent in Kyrgyzstan uh, despite China invested a lot in infrastructure and reconstruction, right? So my question is that just yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Kilbek Japarov, he announced that the Exim Bank of China will get the operative governments of our strategic economic objects if our country won't repay the loan from China. I think that everybody saw th this news and uh, Mm, it's a quite serious reason uh, of raising xenophobia in Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> but my question is uh, concerning the roots of its xenophobia. Uh, and uh, as for me, and I read uh, some of analysts, uh, the root of xenophobia is in epic uh, manas, in Kyrgyz epic manas. Um, where, um, how do you think, is it, is it real? Because in, in this epic, uh, the main adversaries of Kyrgyz people and Manas, the Kyrgyz national hero, they are called Kutailar uh, Kara Kutailar, and the translation is Chinese uh, or Black Chinese. So how do you think, could it be a real reason uh, of uh, xenophobia in Kyrgyzstan and despite the, this debt trap diplomacy that we see now nowadays? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting question. Um, uh, yeah, about Akulbek Chapar. Uh, we have to really think, yes, about our huge um, loan in front of Exim Bank, as I understood like 460 million dollars we owe to China. Uh, so um, in the case of other countries, we should be really concerned that uh, we should really think about that. I agree. Uh, if you don't pay back, according to them, uh, some projects like thermal power plant or that Kakimin or other project will be under the management of China and China may introduce its companies to their uh, to their sites, places. So it's very, it, it, it sounds very, um, concerned, anxious. So uh, thank you for your question. The second is uh, Manas Epic. Uh, when I interviewed Kyrgyz Chalavari, when I did in-depth inter interview, they said it doesn't connect uh, the route because of, uh, because of uh, um, the China was enemy uh, historically to Kyrgyz uh, nomadic Kyrgyz people. It doesn't really, there is no connection that we, go, be, we became xenophobic. Uh, that history doesn't really connect. Today's Chinese people are different. The history is different according to them. Actually, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. So we have one more question from the audience, uh, in-person audience, and then we will give mm -hmm. Uh, they, they turn to the online audience and then come back to this physical audience. Good morning. Is it working? 
Меня зовут Эдир Бул, я являюсь представителем гражданского общества. Очень интересную тему поднимаете, да, действительно, мы все наблюдаем сейчас роль и огромное влияние Китая не только в странах Центральной Азии, но и во всем мире. Очень интересную информацию мы здесь получили. Ну, я хотел бы отметить несколько вещей, что Китай, как мы все видим, является одной из ведущих экономик мира. Соответственно, Китай ведет достаточно прагматичную политику своей страны, в том числе и во взаимоотношениях в экономике в странах Центральной Азии. А учитывая близкое геополитическое соседство, страны Центральной Азии должны выстраивать свою политику и прежде всего изучать много глубже, в том числе исторические аспекты, политические аспекты, и на основании этого выстраивать внешние экономические связи с Китаем. Да, есть такая проблема, что многие страны, не только Кыргызстан, но и другие страны попадают в долговую зависимость от Китая, в экономическую зависимость от Китая. Но эту проблему надо рассматривать, наверное, не только с той позиции, не только с позиции мягкой силы Китая, но и вопросы решения с борьбой с коррупционными проявлениями. И, и, и ваш вопрос, можете сказать, кому конкретно ваш вопрос? И а, у, меня был, да, у меня был просто такая ремарка. И относительно работы неправительственных организаций в Китае, они есть, но они не в той мере, в которой мы привыкли видеть гражданское общество. Спасибо. Спасибо большое за ваш комментарий. Thank you very much for your comment. Now we'll give turn to the online audience that we have. And we have two questions from Sergei Marinin, one to uh, Timur and one to any other speaker. So uh, would you mind turning on your microphone and um, uh, asking your questions? Um, Should I ask the question personally? So uh, Sergei, would you like to answer the, uh, ask your questions or if not, it's okay, you can read them. You can go ahead with answering. No, 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 it's fine, you can read them. I can go ahead and answer the question about the Chinese role in uh, you know, becoming this middle person between Russia and Ukraine. Um, I, I think China was obvious uh, and very uh, direct about that, that uh, it doesn't want to get too much involved into uh, war. Uh, and I actually don't see any prospects of uh, this position uh, changing in the nearest future because um, uh, you know China becoming a mediator in this war would mean that China would have to um, kind of cooperate with uh, with the US with the West um, and and um, in my view this is not something that uh, China wants um, this you know whole crisis to be about uh, right now, China is using um, the whole war narrative um, against the U.S. and blaming everything on the U.S., uh, both uh, for the domestic audience and for international audience. Um, and I think um, this is not going to change. And um, yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Timur. And if you could also take the second question, because I think you. you like your presentation was closest to this second question, uh, whether Russia is a situational ally or not. Yes, about the rivalry between China and Russia um, in Central Asia. I think this whole narrative about the rivalry competition is um, overestimated. And we actually underestimate the level of cooperation that exists there between Beijing and Moscow in Central Asia. Um, and the you know big proof of that uh, we saw on February 4th when uh, Presidents Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping met for the first time since the pandemic in Beijing, um, where they signed the um, agreement, uh, which had a um, you know uh, line 
about closer cooperation in neighboring region and neighboring region being obviously Central Asia. Um, I think China understands that uh, Russia is um, a kind of dominant power in Central Asia and Russia still is uh, the only country that understands Central Asia the most and it has to and, and that China has to cooperate with Russia on that. So um, uh, I do believe that uh, even after the war in Ukraine, we will see more cooperation between China and Russia in Central Asia and not vice versa. Uh, thank you very much, Timur. Do we have any questions or comments from the audience? We have one here. Samar. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Miriam, and I work at the OSC Academy as well. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Timur. Maybe it also concerns uh, Nargiza, yours, your presentation. I wanted to ask about um, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I feel like uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, when it started, was a very huge uh, project and everyone was talking about it. But right now, uh, do you think it's um, the discussion is decreasing? And it, is it still China's um, foreign policy? Like, a, uh, does the China's uh, foreign policy goes under the scope of Belt and Road Initiative? And also um, about the debt trap diplomacy, you have uh, um, touched this topic as well. And I wanted to know if China is um, dealing with this debt trap, uh, uh, trapping countries uh, with the debt, uh, and um, like um, doing, I mean, doing this policy. Uh, are they thinking in the other ways of dealing? with the countries other than trapping them with, the, with their debt. Because uh, in the whole world, everyone, everybody was very concerned about debt trap uh, diplomacy of China. And nobody, uh, they were very cautious, right? And did China um, change its uh, policy after this kind of reaction? Um, and also, I want to ask one more question to Aizad. Uh, thank you so much. Your, uh, research is very, very, very interesting. And um, you said that you had a live observation in Dubai, right? And what did you, what kind of relationship uh, between Chinese workers and uh, Kyrgyz workers did you see? Did, do they talk? Are they friendly to each other? Or they're just, they never talk to each other, they hate each other? Uh, yeah, if you can elaborate more on that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your question. So we'll go uh, in the order that the questions were asked. So Timur, if you could take your question. Yeah, sure. Um, so about BRI. Uh, yeah, it, it's true that um, in the very beginning it was very huge. Um, uh, but I would not say that um, it, uh, you know, um, like, first of all, uh, as, as anything that um, you know started uh, on a very high note um, it's just how the things work right uh, we have new kind of things going on in the world and uh, the old stuff uh, becomes less and less interesting but uh, uh, in my view uh, right now we see the kind of decrease of um, belt and road um, narratives uh, because China actually is becoming uh, more and more isolated. China, uh, I mean, all of the, most most of the countries of the world have uh, reopened after the pandemic, but China is still uh, very conservative and uh, very cautious about reopening. And um, it also, um, I think adds to, um, China's kind of presence in the world. Uh, but um, yeah, um, apart from that, I, I, I don't think that Belt and Road is, you know, something that we should uh, forget about. Uh, and next year, the 10 years anniversary is coming of uh, uh, announcing Belt and Road. So I think that there will be some more interest to this topic, but maybe not now when China is dealing with its own domestic issues. 
Uh, thank you very much, Timur. Now, Nargiza, if you'd like to take your question. Я добавлю, можно на русском, да? На самом деле, я с вами соглашусь, что еще до пандемии, если посмотреть на инвестиции, то с 2018 года примерно наблюдалось уже сокращение инвестиций Китая в рамках BRI. И я полагаю, это было связано отчасти с коррупционными скандалами, отчасти с ухудшающимся имиджем Китая по всему миру, и особенно в том числе в Центральной Азии. И Китаю нужно было некое время для того, чтобы пересмотреть свои проекты в рамках PRI и, возможно, пересмотреть часть своих подходов. Это раз. Далее наступила пандемия, которая, соответственно, внесла также свои коррективы, кризис в Казахстане и война в Украине, что, соответственно, тоже повлияло на Китай, на позицию о том, что что-то надо пересматривать в своих подходах. Соответственно, что мы видим? Мы видим с некоторой степени осознание Китаем того, что в рамках Центральной Азии Казахстан является монополистом в отношении транспортно-логистических перевозок. И в этом отношении поэтому проект железной дороги Китай-Кыргызстан-Узбекистан приобрел, так скажем, новое дыхание. И поэтому стороны стараются как можно быстрее договориться и начать строительство этой железной дороги. Далее мы также наблюдаем, что идет некая трансформация Шанхайской организации сотрудничества, которая будет расширяться и дальше. И в внедренной формации 5 плюс 1. Соответственно, Соответственно, сейчас с окончанием пандемии мы будем видеть, я так полагаю, некие изменения в стратегии Китая в Центральной Азии и пересмотр проектов. Именно поэтому на какое-то время дискуссии относительно БИРА не утихли, но в ближайшее время, на мой взгляд, будет опять возобновление дискуссии относительно плюсов и минусов БИРА. Спасибо большое. Айзат, если хотите, вы можете ответить на ваш вопрос. That's the different thing that uh, because of communication they do have, they have less xenophobic attitudes toward Chinese migrants because of daily communication rather than Kyrgyz Chorolor who built their opinion on the prejudiced um, stereotypes like oh, Chinese people um, are dirty or um, they uh, eat everything and for them money is important. This description is interestingly in literature review, which was described by authors in Western countries around 19th, 18th century. It's very similar description what today described Kyrgyz Chorolor about Chinese migrants. With what I want to say, communication plays a big role in terms of xenophobia. So um, in my research, I found out that in daily relationships, they are, um, local traders are xenophobic, less Kyrgyz um, uh, because of communication they have every day. And according to them, they don't see Chinese traders as a competitors, what previously scholars uh, confirmed, but this is nothing different in my research that I have uh, I have found. Uh, but then they learn, uh, they, and they take some, some stimulus, some uh, encouragement from Chinese uh, traders as an experienced traders. So, um, and of course, they have, of course, uh, pointed out some cultural differences, but uh, it's visible less xenophobic attitudes toward Chinese migrants because of communication uh, with Chinese traders. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Aizat. Now we have uh, a question from the online audience. Uh, Indira Rahimova, would you like to turn on your microphone and ask your question yourself? If not, we can read it out. So I don't hear anything from Indira. So uh, Indira's question is for Aizat, and she says, my question would be, did you have a chance to consider challenges in terms of Chinese companies' practices in Kyrgyzstan? I think there's a big stance for research, as under the BRI project, many Chinese companies were initially highly interested in investing in Kyrgyzstan, but recently their number dramatically fell due to a big number of conflicts with local communities, corruption, etc. Uh, 
So, mm -hmm. very interesting question, I think. Uh, so, I um, could interview some. Uh, this is different project. I could interview some local workers in Chinese. Uh, local workers in Chinese companies. So, um, uh, for example, uh, in uh, South Park, there are uh, gold mining companies, uh, which uh, many conflicts between uh, locals and Chinese uh, Chinese workers have happened. And uh, even in 2000, uh, Recently, Chinese embassy stated that because of misunderstanding, misperception of Chinese people between 2018 and 19, there has been around 22 um, murdered Chinese uh, citizens murdered or beaten up by locals, which is again xenophobia. So, but then. Uh, yeah, this is very interesting that, uh, but then I didn't go deep, but around uh, around this topic, xenophobia is very strong. In Abbasha, for example, there is a, a logistics center was canceled because of, again, a xenophobic attitudes. Uh, it was 2018 when Beckoff visited China uh, in um, Chinese businessmen together with uh, Kyrgyz businessmen, they, uh, uh, started building this logistics center again for f 49 years for 200 hectare uh, plot of land, but which again, because of economic uh, not transparency, local people uh, did around 1,000 people did a rally um, uh, um, anti this building logistics center, which was canceled again. But then last year, President Japarov uh, uh, encouraged um, continue to this. Um, building this logistics center. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Isaac, for your uh, question, uh, for your answer. The next question goes to Timur uh, from Indira. And she's asking, what are your insights on the perception of China in Uzbekistan? Do you expect similar anti-Chinese sentiment like the uh, in other Central Asian countries to increase parallel to the increasing Chinese investments in the country? Yeah, Indira, thank you very much for the great question. Um, right now, I don't see um, the same amount of uh, anti-China sentiment in Uzbekistan compared to what we have uh, been observing for the last several years in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan. Uh, for several reasons. Um, uh, for the last uh, four months, I've been to all Central Asian countries except for Turkmenistan. Um, and I uh, like it's, it's just obvious how uh, the level of, um, you know, uh, Chinese uh, presence differs uh, from one uh, capital to another. Um, uh, and uh, when you go to Tashkent, you almost do not see any Chinese presence there. Um, and another factor is that um, China doesn't have a border with Uzbekistan, with which you know something very obvious. But still, uh, when it comes to Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, this is a very important factor uh, that you know uh, adds to any Chinese sentiment there. Um, and also in Uzbekistan, um, um, I mean, uh, in Kazakhstan and in Kyrgyzstan, uh, there are certain, um, um, you know, uh, people uh, in Kazakhstan, it may be uh, oral months who uh, migrated from Xinjiang to Kazakhstan, who still have relatives in Xinjiang who face, um, you know, problems uh, with the uh, Chinese government because of their um, you know, ethnicity or religion. Um, and that is why this problem for, uh, Kazakh for people in Kazakhstan and, and, and uh, Kyrgyzstan is not just something that they read in the news, but also it's something that they can uh, have uh, uh, the firsthand information. Uh, and, and it also adds to kind of uh, growth of the sentiment uh, against China there. Uh, but with the rise of China's presence in Uzbekistan, um, I do believe that there might be some growth 
of kind of skepticism towards China, but um, I, I'm very doubtful that we will see uh, some kind of protests um, in Uzbekistan against China. And it only has to do with the, you know, the way the political regime in Uzbekistan works and the way um, um, it's, it's kind of uh, much more difficult for uh, people in Uzbekistan to protest, not only against China, but in any uh, topic and yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Timur. Uh, do we have questions from the audience at the OSC Academy? So I don't see any hands, so we will proceed with uh, online questions. There's one question from Sergei Marinin, but uh, Sergei, if you don't mind, we will uh, uh, skip it for now, and if we have time, we'll return to it. Um, then uh, there's a question from uh, Jinyi Dong, and I think that was the question for Nargiza. Uh, and it was misspelled. Um, and the question is, we have seen um, recent, in recent years, many universities have suspended the cooperation with Confucius Institute as it is taken a tool of China's propaganda. What is the Central Asian's perspective regarding the Confucius Institute? Thank you for your question. I guess uh, we have no some kind of suspicious attitudes towards Confucius Institutes in Central Asia. And to be honest, still, it's a matter of question and it's a problem for Central Asian countries to speak with China on equal level. So uh, it's rather difficult to imagine that uh, in some years those institutions would be closed. Uh, I guess they will uh, continue their work. Uh, thank you so much. And the next question comes from uh, Nazgul Alubayeva. And her question is for Aizat uh, regarding the Qirq Choro movement um, that you uh, that Aizat presented. And she says, uh, actually, this movement raises quite controversial reactions among Kyrgyz citizens. It was said that they have a negative attitude to Chinese people and that sometimes they are even aggressive forcing Chinese to leave the Kyrgyzstan. Well, the question is, it is just interesting um, were there any reactions from the Chinese side about the actions of that movement towards Chinese? So, what did Chinese say? Oh, interesting question. Thank you. That's good. Um, actually, uh, sil yeah, silence from China. China. Chinese side, what has happened with Kyrgyz Chorolaru, for example, deported 35 migrants or uh, has been raiding around uh, Chinese companies, but then silence from Chinese side. They, they, they never reported uh, in, in, in state uh, media about what has happening today in Kyrgyzstan uh, toward uh, China, Chinese migrants, and even some Chinese diaspora in Kyrgyzstan media, they, they never report about anti-China mood uh, in media. Uh, so, um, but then, uh, but then, what has happened with uh, Chinese migrants? Then Chinese companies uh, has increased, has been increasing using uh, security companies. There is one, if I remember, Zhong 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 uh, company, security Chinese company, has already twenty clients, uh, Chinese clients, uh, which uh, already has been working at, uh, in gold mining companies. So, um, and also. I think here, um, uh, as I mentioned before, in investment guy, uh, the Chinese embassy mentioned that uh, um, this incidents anti China mode is regularly disturbing on normal operation of Chinese companies. But despite that, they don't never uh, publish or report on Chinese state media or in, in Kyrgyzstan uh, Chinese media. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we had a question or comment from Abbas. We tried to ask him to type it, but he didn't. If you can yeah, ask your question directly, the floor is yours. Я Аббос Бабаханов, являюсь научным сотрудником и докторантом в Университете мировой экономики и дипломатии в Узбекистане. Мне вопрос следующего характера. Ну, адресовано госпоже Наргизе Муратали и потом Рафаэлу Пантучи. 
Вопрос такой заключается. В настоящее время провожу по мягкой силы исследования, вот мягкой силы Китая в Центральной Азии. Сегодня в нашем университете такой маленький круглый стол был, и там была озвучена такая интересная идея. То есть с учетом сегодняшнего характера мировой политики, то есть некоторые участники сегодняшнего мероприятия тоже отметили, что идет такой серьезные проблемы и трансформация мирового порядка. Да? И больше всего проблемы попытаются мировыми актерами силовым путем, то есть путем военного применения, то есть силового применения. И была озвучена в ходе круглого стола такое мнение, что мягкая сила, вот концепция мягкой силы вообще, вот мягкая сила уже утрачивает свою, как, свою роль и переходит все страны на уже жесткую силу, то есть больше преобладает жесткая сила в сегодняшнем мире. В этих условиях, как вы считаете, можем ли сказать, что сегодня Китай будет переходить от мягкой силы на жесткой? И возможно ли китайская мягкая сила переходить на политический уровень? Это первый вопрос. Второй вопрос. Китайская мягкая сила в Центральной Азии для всех стран одинакова или имеет какие-то различия? В чем они проявляются? Или с учетом каких факторов формируется мягкая сила Китая в странах региона? Спасибо большое. Thank you very much, dear Abbas, for two questions that you asked. Unfortunately, Dr. Pantucci had to leave us because he had other commitments. So I'd like to redirect your question to other panelists that we have. So basically, we have two questions. One, is soft power dead? Uh, and the second one, uh, what are the differences in soft power approaches in China, uh, of China soft power in Central Asia? So uh, who wants to take any of those questions? Huh? Рада приветствовать вас, уважаемый коллега, босс, и благодарю за очень такие глубокие и интересные вопросы. Касательно жесткой силы, я согласна с вами, что сейчас в целом актуальность мягкой силы, она спадает с учетом геополитической турбулентности и расширения, так скажем, горячих точек. Но одно но я бы сказала, что именно в Центральной Азии с учетом сильных антикитайских настроений в Казахстане и в Кыргызстане, Китаю, хочет он того или нет, придется применять также инструменты мягкой силы для того, чтобы минимизировать возможные угрозы срыва будущих проектов, в том числе ближайшего проекта, да, который я упомянула о строительстве железной дороги. Поэтому, тем не менее, на мой взгляд, Китай будет балансировать между мягкой силой и жесткими инструментами. И касательно жестких инструментов, Китай действительно их также использует. В частности, это экономическое давление в некоторой степени. Мы знаем пример, когда... В 2020 году Китай достаточно жестко требовал обеспечить безопасность китайских предприятий иначе, ну, с некими намеками, иначе будут проблемы на кыргызско-китайской границе. Да? То есть жесткие элементы давления, они также присутствуют в политике. Примером может служить также основанный в 2017 году четырехсторонний механизм сотрудничества между Таджикистаном, Пакистаном, Афганистаном и Китаем, что также говорит о некоторых амбициях Китая в плане региональной безопасности, основанная его военная база в Таджикистане, но которая официально не признается. И касательно вашего вопроса по имеет ли различие китайская мягкая сила в регионе, безусловно, да. По моим наблюдениям, китайская сила, мягкая сила наиболее активно представлена в Казахстане и в Узбекистане, с учетом того, что эти страны наиболее важны для Китая как экономические партнеры. К примеру, в том же Казахстане наблюдаются довольно-таки активные дискуссии, круглые столы инициируются исследования по многостороннему сотрудничеству с Китаем в рамках Центральной Азии, так и двустороннее сотрудничество, чего не скажешь, допустим, о Таджикистане и о Кыргызстане. 
А если говорить об Узбекистане, примечательным для меня было как исследователя увидеть проект на э, узбекском медиаплатформе «Подробно УЗ», который называется «Ключи от будущего», где стабильно публикуются статьи, э, пропагандирующие и продвигающие китайскую культуру и э, взаимодействие Китая и Узбекистана. Поэтому, на мой взгляд, меньше представлена мягкая сила именно в Таджикистане и в Кыргызстане. Спасибо большое, Тимур. Айзат, хотите ли вы ответить на эти вопросы или нет? Я бы, если можно, тоже прокомментировал. Абосака, спасибо большое за вопрос. Но мне кажется, что мягкая сила все еще играет важную роль в международных отношениях и в мировой политике. Просто нам кажется, что вот сейчас, когда происходят все эти да, войны и санкционные какие-то войны, изоляция и так далее, нам кажется, что это, это не актуально, но при этом мы как бы одновременно вычитываем да, весь тот, все те тренды, которые мы наблюдали все это время, а именно это снижение насилия по всему миру и переход стран от чего-то жесткого к такому больше влиянию и так далее. Да? Мне кажется, это тот тренд, который будет продолжаться, несмотря ни на что. И, конечно, он не будет проходить линейно. Будут какие-то вот такие скачки и возвраты назад и такие какие-то консервативные повороты, но все же это ну, для нас, может быть, это занимает большое количество времени, но в историческом масштабе это не так. Поэтому я бы не стал говорить о том, что мягкая сила больше не актуальна и не релевантна в мире. В том числе это касается и Китая. Спасибо большое, Тимур. So, uh, we have a question from Indira. Indira, if you would like to turn on your camera and ask your question, and please specify who, would you, who, who you are addressing your question to. Uh, dear colleagues, good day. Can you hear me well? Of course, I'm in headphones. Uh, okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to ask a question. Uh, my name is Indira Rakomila, and I'm a research assistant at Freiburg University Research Team. We are also doing currently research on Central Asia BRI implications for Kazakhstan. And uh, my question is uh, for all presenters. I, I have also quest asked questions in Zoom chat, but I actually had a bad connection, so I, I, I guess I couldn't hear an answer, but I have a common question about Central Asian integration. So uh, the question is uh, regarding the recent trends around the uh, perception of China in Central Asia. There are some talks and even at the state level that it would be better for our countries to integrate and uh, stand together uh, in front of China in terms of economics, politics and other issues. And that way it would be more visible, it would be more transparent, yeah, and um, I guess uh, more valuable and advantages for our countries. In this regard, I would like to ask what are your insights on this issue? Because I guess I couldn't hear any special, uh, I guess, insights or perspective for this topic. So, please. So, Indira, let me uh, paraphrase your question. Are you asking whether, um, Central Asian countries should integrate or increase their integration in order to be able to uh, um, deal with China and other countries better? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, this is one side of question and the other, what is the current trend in terms of Central Asian integration on negotiations with China, I guess. Because there are some negotiations, there are some, uh, I mean, topic uh, raised during this multilateral uh, event but I don't see any particular uh, integrations, I mean, processes happening among our countries. So I just want to hear uh, our presenter's opinion Thank on this you. issue. Yeah, Thank you very much. And uh, I see Nargiza would like to take the floor, yeah? 
Спасибо большое за вопрос, очень интересный. Действительно, в условиях нарастающих угроз одно из решений было бы, ну, я бы сказала, не интеграция, а скорее региональное сотрудничество да, и тот формат, который сейчас продвигается между пятью странами Центральной Азии. Кстати, в ближайшее время будет следующий саммит глав государств Центральной Азии. И здесь такой момент, интеграция на данный момент она невозможна в силу да, наличия скорее конкуренции между лидерами и вообще странами Центральной Азии, чем сотрудничество, но региональное сотрудничество возможно. Опять-таки здесь разное видение. Да? Допустим, если Узбекистан продвигает концепт регионального сотрудничества, делая ударение на регионе Центральной Азии, то Казахстан делает ударение на кооперации, то есть подчеркивая, что Казахстан готов к усилению экономического сотрудничества. То есть, как мы видим, здесь немножко разное видение уже к формату регионального сотрудничества, однако процесс уже пошел, что довольно-таки хорошо. Основными препятствиями на пути регионального сотрудничества являются вопросы разделения, распределения воды и, естественно, нерешенные приграничные вопросы. И Касательно сотрудничества с Китаем, здесь мне хотелось бы отметить, как раз таки, допустим, Казахстан до сих пор имеет нерешенные водные вопросы с Китаем. И в случае, если бы региону удалось бы продвинуться в рамках регионального сотрудничества, то на региональном уровне тому же Казахстану было бы легче продвигать решение водных вопросов с Китаем. То же самое касается и каких-то других вопросов экономического сотрудничества, транспортно-логистического вопроса. Было бы легче решать эти вопросы, если бы регион был бы более сплоченным. Однако идут уже подвижки и, на мой взгляд, начинать надо действительно с экономического сотрудничества и с усиления межрегиональной торговли, потому что все еще регион больше торгует с Россией и Китаем, нежели друг с другом. И когда эту тенденцию удастся переломить, когда наши страны будут торговать больше друг с другом, тогда и внешнее давление и влияние внешних стран будет снижаться. Thank you very much, Nargiza. Aizad, Timur, would you like to take any of these questions? Um, yeah, um, I think here we, we, we come to this um, problem um, that, you know, the, the, the roots of this problem goes down to domestic issues and not to you know, kind of problems that we have in relations with China. Um, and of course, when we talk about regionalism or let alone like uh, integration, um, it's very um, difficult to imagine because of the problems that we have in the region because of the, even the, you know, the national identity of every single country uh, was created kind of against others to to become to to look as different as possible from other central asian countries so um, until we figure out these until we figure out what are uh, the common kind of um, ideological things that connects us, I, I think it will be very difficult to imagine Central Asia becoming more as a real region than uh, just um, the number of countries that we all um, got used to uh, collectively call um, region. And, and you know, uh, before that, um, I'm very skeptical about uh, seeing uh, regionalization here in Central Asia, and especially when it comes to China. Um, China for years has been doing, uh, you know, uh, being present in the region bilaterally and be, been criticized before because of that. Uh, and we see how in recent years, China is trying to change its um, policy towards Central Asia, trying to institutionalize its presence here, creating this format that almost all Kind of big countries already have with uh, Central Asia, Central Asia plus one. Yeah, we also now have China plus Central Asia. Um, so China is trying to institutionalize this, but but I don't think that it's something really tangible. Uh, I still believe that all of the most important questions are solved bilaterally and and not um, in, institutionally. Uh, thank you very much, Timur. Uh, I think. Uh... We, we only have 10 minutes left. 
and we just have one question pending and this is from Sergey. So before uh, reading out uh, Sergey's question, I'd like to ask all the panelists uh, to summarize uh, the takeaway messages that you would like to convey to the audience. Um, and each of you will have three minutes and in three minutes, please uh, specify the most important takeaway message for the audience and if you would like to um, answer the question of Sergei, you can also squeeze it in there. And uh, Sergei asked, will China versus Russia competition for Central Asia increase in the near term, or um, there is no significant rivalry between these two powers? So uh, let's um, check. Yeah. Uh, uh, so let's start with Aizat this time. So Aizat, then Timur, and maybe Nargiza, if we can go in that order. Three minutes for each of you to, for, to do a wrap up. Thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and listening uh, to our um, uh, presentation. So, um, uh, my short message is from my presentation is uh, how um, it's research about xenophobia and it's. Um, factors affect on xenophobic attitudes toward today's um, uh, xenophobic groups but uh, today I would just like to um, uh, give a short message uh, about uh, uh, what xenophobic uh, what factors affect on xenophobia it's like it's very important to uh, it, um, I just would like to say it's very important to uh, important this uh, prejudices and uh, conspiracy theory and hearsay rumors uh, about Chinese occupation soft power is really play a great role in daily life of uh, daily life of uh, local people and their uh, interactions with uh, interactions with uh, Chinese migrants living in Kyrgyzstan uh, thank you Nargiza. Oh, uh, Timur and then Nargiza. Timur would you like to take the floor yeah thank you um so my short message uh, is not to jump into conclusions uh, and not to be um, not to think that um, Russia uh, can be kind of deleted or cancelled from Central Asia yet. Um, and another uh, you know message is. Um, not to overestimate the potential of rivalry between Russia and China in Central Asia. Um, so, yeah, to put it in a nutshell. Um, and I also want to thank everyone. Um, Aizad Nargiza, great presentations. I'm a huge fan um, and, and was happy to, to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Timur. And Nargiza, the floor is yours. I would say so soft power of China is a, uh, is really important uh, issue in Central Asia, and if China wants uh, successfully to start building its huge railway project connecting uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, it has to work not only in the capital of Kyrgyzstan in Bishkek, but it has to work with use in regions. Uh, with uh, it has to use some kind of uh, creative approach uh, to make it influence softer and to uh, make it uh, image better. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much um, to um, the presenters and um, to everyone who has joined us today. As a mod moderator, I was also very fascinated and very uh, impressed by the amount of, uh, by the level of expertise that we have accumulated here in Central Asia, by the amount of the um, um, uh, research and, and scholarship that uh, the, uh, the Central Asian region has been producing. And I would like to take this opportunity to take uh, to thank IWPR, Kabar Asia, and uh, Sergei Marinin in particular for uh, reaching out to us and putting together this event. Uh, I truly think that it was a great success. And uh, um, yeah, just stay tuned for future events. And uh, I hope we didn't miss anyone's uh, question. 
Uh, if you do have some burning questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of us or to any of the panelists, and I'm sure you will be able to um, uh, get the answers. And last but not least, there's a feedback form. We always try to improve and make uh, our events better. So there are two feedback forms for those people who are participating online. Please try to, uh, you, you can fill it out straight on the um, uh, Zoom. For, for those people who are here, there are the new, uh, QR codes you can scan and it will redirect you to the uh, online feedback form. And there's also one QR code that uh, uh, in Samar's possession, so if you'd like, if you can request it from him, sc uh, scan it, and please make sure to fill it out. There are also some offline, like uh, paper-based, uh, classic uh, feedback forms. If you prefer those, please also feel free to fill those out. And now uh, we would like to invite all of you to the coffee break, which will be on the hallways. And for those uh, who are online. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, we are looking forward to seeing you again in the next on uh, yeah, sometime soon. <laughs>